Yeah, I don't even know where to begin. Dennis, and then I'll start at the beginning. <laughs> so uh, I think I became Dennis' a student back in 1989, way back when JR was just a funny young college at the time. <laughs> <laughs> decades younger, of course. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> now, when Dennis took us in, uh, Dennis gave us a home in the herbarium in San Francisco State, and uh, it was then, now, and it continues to be a truly magical place for those folks that have been lucky enough to spend some time with. And Dennis fostered us and in our interests in mycology, and Dennis has done so for how many years now? Too many. Too many. <laughs> and I know that the other night I would have had a car with all these nuts, but Dennis has been there uh, for, for a number of years. I came in in 1989, and he had replaced his mentor, Dr. Harry Tears, and was directing the herbarium there. And JR and I were there together as graduate students at the time. And as I look around the room, I see a handful of other students right. who are also master students with Dennis that have gone on to do to do amazing things. And so it's a really it's a very humbling thing to to, to be able to introduce your mentor but also to see the products of what he's produced and what a massive contribution he's made to the field of mythology. And that I will say that I've been incredibly fortunate that as I sort of grew up and in my you know got my position in my career, Dennis and I have been able to continue our collaborations and we've done a lot of work around the world. And I will say that Dennis is one of the, he's one of these amazing mycologists. There's not too many around these days, but people that have traveled around the world and have collected mushrooms just about every place you can imagine. And they have described species and they've made massive contributions to our knowledge of fungi and fungal diversity from around the world. So Dennis is truly a, uh, you know, he's a renaissance man when it comes to, comes to fungal diversity. And there's, there's not that many people that can claim to have been to as many places in the world and has described as many new species to science as Dennis has. And it's, a, it's a truly a, it's a very impressive list of names that you have, species that is, with your name added to it. It's just truly phenomenal. And so tonight, Dennis is going to tell a little bit about some of the work that I was fortunate enough to do with him in Africa. He'll tell you the background story about how he went down on a trip there and collected, what, 200 specimens? We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and these were destroyed by the U.S. Customs folks. So I was fortunate enough, like, although that sounds like a bad thing, it worked out in my favor because I got to go back down on a trip to recollect many of these specimens. But now, so I was lucky enough to, I did my master's degree with Dennis uh, many, many years ago and came back and did a, did a postdoctoral work with him um, before starting my current position. And so uh, part of that was going down to South Dominican and Principe and, like these mushrooms. And so he'll be telling you about all that tonight. And uh, let's welcome Dr. Deja. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight actually started about uh, 12 years ago. You can see in April of 2006. And uh, because of some snafus that I'll tell you about again, uh, I, I brought Brian into the project in 2008, so 10 years ago, and we went back again. So I decided that Brian's going to give a talk tonight. So. <laughs> he could do it if he wanted to. Um, so basically, the type of work that we do doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of time in the field to actually do the work. That's the fun part. And the real work then happens back in the lab, year after year after year, trying to, to do the type of documenting biodiversity before we use it, which is kind of what we've been doing. Uh, so I want to kind of tell you about that process. I'm going to do that by talking about this one place where we've done uh, two expeditions now. Uh, and if it was easier to get to, I would continue going back there. But it's basically 36 hours to get there. And the flights that fly in only fly in once a week. And if you miss a flight, you're stuck another week. And it's, it's not the easiest place to get to. So the place I'm talking about is the country of Sao Tome and Principe. So here's Africa, and I talk about this, well, it's in the Gulf of Guinea. Let's talk about this as being the center of the world. So I put some of the lines here so you can see there's zero latitude and longitude. Right there is where it is, almost smack in the center of the world. All right? Uh, here is uh, Sao Tome, and here is Principe here. They're oceanic islands, so volcanic in origin, much like the Hawaiian Islands. They erupted from a hot spot in the ocean. <laughs> They've never been connected to any continental land masses at all, which means that when they come out of the ocean and form a new island, anything that's there has to get there. 
in some way. So they got to blow out or swim out or something like that. So this allows for a lot of uh, endemism. Uh, an area where lots of the organisms that are there are only found there and nowhere else. And there are high levels of endemism. I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, the oldest island is Principe, it's about 31 million years old, and it's subsiding now, which like the Hawaiian islands are. So you can see the size of what's underwater in the blue there, that used to be above. And uh, Sao Tome is the younger of the island at about uh, 13 million years old. Okay? The islands were unpopulated until the 15th century, and then they were colonized by the Portuguese. And unfortunately, the Portuguese used these islands as the site in the hop-off place for their boats for the slave trade. So it was initially populated by the Portuguese, and then they went and they got a lot of Africans from Guinea-Bissau and Angola primarily, brought them to the islands, and then shipped them off to Haiti and other places in the Caribbean as part of the, as part of the slave trade. Uh, sugarcane, they were one of the leading uh, places where they would grow sugarcane. That was the main product for a while. You'll see that, that that changed. They finally got independence in 1975. So down here, just a, a few data about, about this country. Uh, Sao Tome, with the largest island, has the most people. Principe is really tiny. It's only about 6,000 people on the little island of Principe. It's the oldest, it's the least populated, which means it's the least uh, destroyed by humans. So the most old growth forest you're going to find on Prince of Day. 95% uh, of the population is African. 46% of the population is under 16 years old. They like to do it there. 80% uh, are Christian. 20% uh, are animist. And they speak Portuguese. Okay, just to get a, get a feel for it. Uh, here's the international airport on Prince of Day. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to show you this because you have to wait for the dogs to get off the runway before you can land your little plane. Uh, this is the commercial uh, flight that you take from uh, South of Maine to get to the airport. Uh, just going to show you a, a real quick little journey through to get kind of a feel of what the islands are like. Uh, this is the tallest mountain. Uh, it's at Pico Sao Tome on Sao Tome. Beautiful little volcanic island, uh, mountains. So these islands basically are like, you know, cones. And then they narrow down to the coast, and there's a little flat land around it. Most of the habitations occur right around the coast, and the steep mountainsides are uncultivated and uninhabited. That's where we go. That's where the native forest is, uh, mostly. And then you see a number of these little cinder cones as well, where the land around it is, is uh, deteriorated, and you still have these basaltic cones. Uh, all this basaltic rock. This is a baobab tree. Uh, they're indigenous now to Sao Tome, but they basically are of Madagascar in origin with these trees. And uh, there's the uh, peak of Sao Tome in the background. Here's the island of Principe and the tall peak right there. Uh, it's only about 900 meters. That's a uh, peak of Principe. And of course, you can just see the, the wonderful coastlines like this. Along the coast, a lot of palms and this, this basaltic rock. Uh, black sand beaches. This is one of the, the, the little sand dollars that they have there. It's indigenous to this, this part of the world. Uh, it's actually, it's actually this, the species name is Digiformis. I uh, put these little fingers along the side of it there. Uh, the habitations are basically small shacks, as you see here, and quite a few abandoned colonial homes. And uh, families live in these old colonial homes. And here's, you see a lot of this uh, around, and you see it's really not kept up very well at all. No matter what you might have read in uh, on the tweets, this is not one of the S-hole countries. Just so you know, people are good here. Uh, as I said, uh, nearly half the population is under 16 years old. So you run into little children all the time just running around. What are you doing? Yeah, in Portuguese. Right? Uh, as I said, there uh, used to be sugarcane was the major crop there in the islands. Uh, and here's an old abandoned sugarcane factory. Uh, but now they're known mainly for their chocolate. And here's what, uh, if you haven't seen cacao, here's what it looks like. And here's a close-up of it. The fruits kind of hang off the tree because the flowers hang off the sides of the, of the trunk. Uh, which, if you haven't uh, experienced this at all, you crack these open. And inside are the, are the chocolate seeds. And each chocolate seed is surrounded by a pulp, a very soft, sweet, almost a citrus, almost a citrus mango flavored pulp. So you can crack open a ripe uh, a cocoa pod like this, pull out the seeds, and then just suck that pulp off. It's absolutely wonderful. And then they take the seeds and roast them, of course, and chocolate in that picture. Uh, so chocolate and coffee. So the country now is known for its coffee and is known for its chocolate around the world. 
So those are the main commodities. And of course, there's a small techno technology sector as well. <laughs> okay. The goal of this project to go there was to document the diversity of the fleshy fungi from these two uh, islands, this country, South Maine and Prince of Bay. And so, uh, just to give you kind of an overview again, uh, South Tomei is the largest island with only about 854 uh, square kilometers. Prince of Bay is pretty tiny. They're relatively the same distance, distance in kilometers from the mainland of Africa. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Cameroon, Sierra Leone, uh, those are all kind of surrounding it there in the, in the armpit of Africa. Uh, if you look at some of the ideas of the number of species of plants, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians from the islands, and the percent of endemism, you see, you know, somewhere between, you know, a, a small number for the reptiles, but 30% of the mammals and birds are endemic, known only from these islands, which is a relatively high percentage, and uh, a, a same amount over here. All of the amphibians are, are endemic to both South Tomei and Prince of Bay. And you see the question marks there because nobody really knows what, uh, what was going on with, with that. Just a, two pictures I want to show you of some of the endemic uh, uh, plants and, uh, and amphibian. Uh, these, this is a begonia. Uh, there's the flowers. That leaf is almost a meter in diameter. So those of you who have begonias as house plants, this thing is incredible. The leaves are like this. It's almost like a gunner leaf. And uh, if you don't know what a Sicilian is, I don't mean the Italian Sicilians, this is something different. This is a Sicilian here. These are legless amphibians. So you're, you're pulling apart the old banana uh, uh, stems, and out comes this bright yellow thing on the top. You roll it over, and it's purple on the underside. It's got two eyes at one end, and it has all these segments like a worm, but it's not. It's a legless amphibian. Totally cool. Endemic to, uh, to South Sudan. Okay, so in 2006, we went on this expedition. Prior to this, we did some research to figure out what was known about the mushrooms, the fleshy fungi of, of South Tome and Prince of Hay. Before we got there, four species of mushrooms were reported. And this was done by Presidola and Robinier back in 1890. No one has gone there to collect, to document the fleshy fungi since 1890. Uh, we went there to, or I went there in 2006 and discovered 88 species of microfungi in 52 genera. And at the time, just know, knowing the fungi pretty well, it looked like a lot of these were going to end up being new species, and probably a pretty high level of endemism. Okay? Uh, all the specimens were placed in my luggage. The luggage was lost by Air Portugal. The reason why it was lost, I found out, was because in the airport there in Sao Tome, they handwrite on the luggage tag where your luggage is supposed to go. And they hand wrote it that it was going to Lisbon, Portugal, as opposed to Lisbon, Portugal, then San Francisco, California. <laughs> All right, so we got back to San Francisco, no luggage. It was hiding in the airport of Lisbon for uh, five days. They found it in Lisbon finally, and then they shipped the luggage back to the United States, but it came into the Newark uh, International Airport. They opened up the luggage, and right there on top in my luggage was an eight and a half by 11 sheet that said in 900 point font, do not destroy, permits attached, and then eight pages of permits and then the specimens. They just ripped that off, took the specimens, took them out and burned them all. Oh. So one month in the field, all the work in the field, all this great collecting in the field, photographs of them, and no material. You can't sequence burned material. It's not so absolutely no, no material whatsoever. Destroyed everything. That was kind of a heartbreak. Uh, so what happened was, uh, basically, we, I came back. Uh, the leader of the expedition, you see his name down there at the bottom, uh, Robert Drews. Uh, he went around and gave some talks. I went around and gave some talks about this and then showed the pictures of what we found, explained what had happened, and. Uh, a number of individuals in the audience said, oh my god, that's really awful. What would it take to go back? So we gave them a dollar figure, and they pulled out their checkbooks and wrote personal checks, and that allowed us to go back. Philanthropy. It was really fantastic. And enough money to bring a postdoc, <coughs> Dr. Brian, at the time, and Dr. Brian Perry, uh, he came with me at the time. And we had some supplemental support from the Cal Academy of Sciences and a number of conservation, Belgian conservation groups down there as well. They actually own the airplane that took us to Principe, and they, they own the place where we stayed, which I'll show you a picture of in just a second. So in 2008, we were able to go back. 
Okay? Uh, here's the leader of the expedition. You have to see. This is Dr. Uh, Robert Drews. He's a herpetologist. He's the, the world's authority on the amphibian and reptiles of Africa. He's written a huge book, The uh, Amphibians and Reptiles of East Africa. Uh, he's a well-dressed field uh, person, as you can see. <laughs> I particularly like the bear midriff, right? <laughs> and he always knows where he is. I mean, I love this photograph. I mean, <laughs> all the places you can stand. You stand right in the middle of a mud puddle to look at the birds. He's also a bird here as well. So. Anyway, uh, Bob Drews uh, has been going to the uh, South Sudan and Prince of Bay for many years now, almost two decades now. And he started uh, doing multidisciplinary expeditions there to try and document the diversity of plants, fish, uh, reptiles and amphibians, birds, and now fungi. So we, we jumped in on this project as well. And so he's had the infrastructure set up for us. So, we, so it made it a little bit easier for us, and he was able to, to, to direct everything down. So when we went there, uh, we went with two botanists, Tom Daniels and uh, Rebecca Wink over here, a photographer, uh, Wes Eckerman here, there's Brian and there's Bob Drews, and I'm photographing at the moment. Okay? Uh, this is the hovel we had to stay at uh, on Prince Bay. It was just awful. <laughs> and it was actually most of it was just provided to us at very, very low cost by this conservation group. So it was, it was really wonderful. And, on Ritz Bay and on uh, Sao Tome, we stayed at, at another uh, hotel complex as well, which we set up for, for our labs. Uh, we were able to uh, rent four-wheel drive vehicles to get out into the field. Uh, you have to get out. Uh, often your roads are just blocked for one reason or another, so it's not easy to get to where you want to go. But sometimes this is kind of what you're looking at here. You get in your four-wheel drive, you find a road, and you head up as high as you can up into the mountains. And then you head off on, on foot, and you get to hike through some wonderful areas. There's a national park there, uh, uh, Obo Park, and this is a little trail that goes there. And then you get up to these high elevations where all the trees are, are just absolutely beautiful, old growth native forests. So we're able to get up into these areas and collect, collect along the riparian habitats, collect along the coast where the baobab trees are, uh, walk along whatever trail you can find. Uh, the herpetologist, he was looking for cobra. He was out, he was out collecting cobras and, and frogs and, and, and other amphibians and some other reptiles. And uh, the plant guy here was collecting plants and then we're down here somewhere uh, uh, collecting fungi in sorts of habitats like this. We walk around and we collect with our little fish and tackle boxes because a lot of the fungi are very small, as, you, as you'll see soon. Uh, and then when you have spent all day long, the idea is to get up early in the morning, get in, get in your vehicle, uh, drive out into the forest, collect for about four or five hours until you get enough specimens to, to work with, and then get back in the vehicles, come back, and go back to your lab. So this is our lab. You'll notice mycologists have to have some kind of mycology aid as well. Uh, it takes about 35 to 60 minutes to write notes on any one specimen. So if you have 10 specimens, you're looking at five hours of work taking notes on them once you get back. And so that's what you do here. So we sit down, we take notes on them, uh, we draw them, we write all the macromorphological characters, we take photographs of all of them, some of them culture, some of them we, we take off a parts of the tissue, stick them in Epidorf tubes with ethanol so we can extract DNA out of it later. We have color guides and on and on and on. So we write our descriptions and illustrations in the laboratory. Then after hours of doing this, we, uh, we test the volume of some of the little ascomycete cups here. And I want you, I want you to notice that you know diversity is also important. There's one scotch and there's a different one right there. <laughs> so we have to keep ourselves so uh, busy while we're we're working really hard on these on these descriptions. All right. So what did we find? What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of some of the different fungi that we found, and and we've published quite a bit of this now. And we're sl slowly doing it. So now we're 10 years after we were actually in the field. And it's taken us that long to actually work up this material and get it published. It's not something you do overnight. This is really a long, long process. So I'm just going to kind of go through some of them and show you uh, some of these fungi. Uh, so basically, I'll start with a, a group that are called the gymnopoid fungi. They look like the genus Gymnopus, which is what this little guy is. Uh, almost all of the fungi that are there are saprotrophs. They're decomposers, so they're often small, 
grow in, in relatively large numbers, like little tiny free bodies. They're not like the ectomycorrhizal, rushulas and lactarias and bolides and things like that. So the greatest diversity of these are, are saprotrophs. Uh, when we publish them, and here we found 31 species in 14 different genera, and look at the numbers. Ten of these are new species, and the other 21 were new distribution records. So nobody had ever found any of these on the islands before, and ten of them were new species. Uh, we've got to describe all of the micromorphological characters, draw the, the pertinent and taxonomically important micromorphological characters, and as you will see, we also sequence the uh, DNA out of them and, and generate phylogenetic trees. To, uh, to honor two of the gentlemen that uh, provided the funds for us to go back, one's name is Rock Hall, the other's name is Bill Bowes, uh, named some fungi after them. So we've got a Gymnopus Rock Hallii and a Gymnopus Bill Bowesii now, uh, which is kind of cool. And I also want you to look, if you look at that, see that fungus there? Okay, look at it closely, and then look at that one. They look identical, don't they? I'll show you a phylogenetic tree in a second. They're, they're apples and oranges. Yeah, it's amazing how different these things are. A lot of new species in this group, this is a new species here, we called it Ocellus, because it looks like the iris of a brown eye, which basically is Ocellus. Uh, just see some, some of them going through here. Here's the genus Trogia. Uh, we found four species of Trogia. These are really beautiful, decurrent eels, almost like a little chanterelle. But they're very, very tough. You can stretch them a little bit. They don't tear. Uh, um, interesting tissues inside as well. Mainly a tropical genus. You won't find these in the, in the one species in temperate habitats. Oh, we'll go back again. Look at the gills here as well. It's a gill fungus on its way to being a bolete, basically. So gills turning into tubes, the ancestor is gilled. Uh, other little ones, little mycetinus here. This one smells like garlic, as does almost everything in the genus mycetinus. There's some really neat looking cells in it as well. Uh, Hymeomyces, this is related to uh, Xeronphalina, you know the little Xeronphalina ones, it's a tropical genus, and uh, Amrasmios palmiborus here. Uh, and then some really interesting ones, this little guy uh, totally threw me for a loop. Uh, looking at this, it looked to me like a brown sport thing that I knew from Southeast Asia, and the genus Pyroglossum. So I thought sure it was a pyroglossum, and I went through all the literature on pyroglossum, and I thought, damn, I've got a new species. It's a pyroglossum with the smallest spores known. And then Brian sequenced it, and it matched identical, 100% sequence, to uh, Pleurocolobia imbricata, which was described from Belize. Belize, Africa, kind of crazy. There's a big ass ocean in between. <laughs> yeah, very stiff. Well, it wasn't always that they were together. I don't think this lineage goes back 85 million years, however. Uh, but we do have slave trade between Africa and Belize. So I think it did. I think it came as human interest, as many of the fungi were, as a matter of fact. So this is a really good look at all the rhizomorphs down here. Really a neat, a neat little fungus. And then we have some really, really beautiful ones as well. I got a picture of one of these looking right down on it. It looks just like a cheese pizza. <laughs> this is Cyphotrema aspirata. Uh, Brian will have more to say about this. Uh, this name has been used for, for a species that it covers around the globe in various habitats. And he's, he's working on a project now in the genus Cyptotrema. And there's probably some, uh, uh, some taxa hiding under the name uh, Cyptotrema aspirata. And then, of course, when you have these, you have to, you know, extract the DNA, run phylogenetic trees to prove that these things are actually new species. So in other, in other words, in order to describe a new species, you have to know everything that's already been described in that genus and then be able to compare what you have to all those other taxa in one way or another. And so there's a lot of different ways to do it, whether you're using morphology or, or molecules, and we use a combination of both. And you run the trees, and uh, let me see if I can find it here. There's Gymnopus melanopus, that was the first picture I showed you, and down here is Gymnopus rodhallii, in two completely different clades, quite this, <coughs> although they looked almost identical. Yeah, strange stuff. Uh, of those gymnopoids, 32% were new species and putatively endemic. We can't say anything is endemic because you only know it as well as you know it, right? So as far as we know now, it's only known from there. But it could also occur in Gabon or Cameroon or some of these other areas, but nobody's gone there and collected yet. All right. Uh, we also found some interesting ones. This is a beautiful little guy. This is actually the type species of the genus uh, Campanella. Uh, this uh, type was described from Togo, 
uh, which is not too far away from, from Sao Tome. We were able to recollect it, uh, sequence it, and finally redescribe it because there's a lot of species in the genus Campanella that everybody's arguing over. Who are you? What, do you belong to this genus or not? We're unclear where the genus belongs in the greater scheme of things. And the only way you can address and answer those questions is if you have a collection of the type species that represents that genus. And every genus has one species that is representative of the genus. That's called the type species. So you have to know what that type is about before you can say something belongs to the genus and is closely related to it. No one's known this before, so we were able to recollect this one, as well as a beautiful little tetrapyrgos from Madagascar, and we published this paper uh, just this last year, uh, redefining these, so now we can uh, stabilize those two genera. <coughs> uh, here are a little Marasmia species. We've got uh, 22 species. Five of them are new, and uh, <coughs> seven of them, the rest of them, are new distribution records, because again, nobody's ever collected these before. Uh, so you just kind of see some of the diversity there. Uh, some more diversity here, a couple of these are new species, and uh, then this orange one, this is a, I've never seen one like this before, that's also another species, so we're going to name it uh, Laranja, which is Portuguese for orange. <laughs> uh, and here's the phylogenetic tree, you can see it's a big tree, so you have to break it up into three areas, and the new species are hiding in there, I don't expect you to see them. Uh, of the known species from there now, uh, again, 23% of them are new species, maybe endemic, all right? Mycena, this is a project that's being worked on right now by Lexi Cooper over here, one of my graduate students. So she's working on this. We think there's about 19 species, and every time we're going to them, almost every one of these is looking like it's new. Uh, so we're gonna have a very uh, high percentage of them. This is a Mycena, look at it, it's got tubes. Okay, so that's one of those poroid Mycenas. Uh, it's often put in the genus Phyllobolinus. And there's that one I was talking to you about today, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, and then the genus Hemimycene, I'm just going to pop through a few of these. You can see the scale bars here. Many of these are tiny fungi. That's 10 millimeters. So the whole mushroom is just a little tiny band like that. Uh, Hemimycena is, is all, they're all <coughs> pure white like this. And beautiful little guys like this. Again, very small. Here's an interesting genus as well that nobody's probably seen. This is a genus Calotella. That's the way they grow. It's like a lampshade kind of hanging down. And the spores are produced inside. It's completely smooth up there. No gills or anything. They're produced up inside there. And again, pretty tiny. And it's probably a new species. I don't know. And then some little beautiful poroid mycenas. This is another genus, Stabilashia, that falls right out inside the, the middle of the genus uh, Mycena. Uh, but you see it's got a little stem on the side, the lateral stem there. And then it has these pores. We usually define these by the number of pores. There are four cord and 20 cord and 15 cord and there's even some two cord. There's two holes. It looks like a butt. <laughs> <laughs> and then another weird one here, the genus Mycenoporella. This also has little tubes, uh, but the tubes are so shallow that they're just little, little tiny depressions. Uh, and there's only two species known in this genus, and this is, this is one of them, really a beautiful one. Uh, the hygrophoroid fungi, uh, we only found four species, three of them are new. That was it. Uh, this is a new species, this is a new species. Uh, this is in a section of hygrosophy that has two different kinds of basidia. It has macrobasidia that form big spores and microbasidia that form little tiny spores. So you look around under the microscope, you see little spores and big spores, you think it's contaminated. And then you see the basidia, the big ones and the little ones. Really weird. And the whole section does that. And, and this is a new species of Cooperfilis. I thought it was a hygrosity until we sequenced it. It wasn't. <laughs> and now we're working on this. And hopefully, uh, within a week, we'll have the trees done. Uh, Brian's finishing up uh, drawing the trees right now, anyway, the phylogenetic trees. Uh, we've got six species of Pluteus. Two of them are new, uh, so a third of them are, are potentially endemic, anyway. This guy's beautiful. The cap is like velvet. And the whole surface of the cap is formed with hairs like these that you have to stand straight up and down with little spiny hairs. And you can see some of the other the microscopic characters there and a couple other ones here. Uh, this one was described originally from the Congo, so it made its way over. Uh, and look at the cystidia on these weird things. This is my favorite one here. It's got these little tiny knobs that, that branch up at the top. Very strange characters like that. Then we published the dark sport uh, just last year. 
a number of these with, with dark rusty brown spores or, or black spores. This is a gallerina, and you can see the, the roughened spores here, some of the characters. This is a crepidotis, so it kind of looks like a, a oyster mushroom, except it has rusty brown spores. And, and this was a new species, and actually when I looked at this, when you look at it from the side, uh, you know those uh, the, the kind of hats that are made by the company Kangol? It's got the, ca the, the uh, kangaroo in the back, the little, little cap. I see some hats around it, look kind of like that. This reminded me of the Kangol hat, so I named it Kangol Aformis. <laughs> and then I sent, I sent a copy of the, of the paper off to the company that makes them, and they never sent me a cap. <laughs> I can't it. It pissed me off. I mean, at least when we named something after SpongeBob SquarePants, Nickelodeon sent me a stuffed toy of SpongeBob. <laughs> that, I, mean, I was hoping for a new hat. I didn't write him back. Come on. And then there's a bunch of the inky caps down there. A few of them, anyway. This is a new species. They got really beautiful powdery stuff on the, like sugar on the cap surface. This is what the cells look like up there on the cap surface. And then this guy was first, first described from uh, Papua New Guinea, and here it is showing up in, in, in West Africa. Uh, same sequences, I mean, it's really, it fits perfectly. A number of Satharellas, two new species here, Satharella cacao, that grows on chocolate, and Satharella ovoensis grows inside of ovos. <laughs> <laughs> it, it occurs in the state forest called Oba. <laughs> Oba State Forest, I got Oba uh, This is, a, these are what used to be Silosomy, or could have been Silosomy species, but now in the genus Deconica. This was one of the species that we described from Java, uh, and it shows up again in Africa, and uh, Deconica protea was described from Malaysia, and then showing up there in Africa. Interesting. And then you guys know the sulfur tuft around here, uh, Hypholoma fasciculare. This is the tropical analog to Hypholoma fasciculare, the sulfur tuft that we get here. Look at the size, 10 millimeters. So each of these are like little mycenas, little, little caps like this, very small little mushrooms, and they grow by the tens of thousands on the side of logs like this. Uh, when we first collected it, I, I was familiar with Hypholoma subverity, which is described from uh, Cuba, and in the Caribbean area, and I'm very familiar with the, this mushroom from there, and so I thought it was uh, Hypholoma subverity. So what we did, and Brian did this work, is we you know, sequenced our stuff, and there's our stuff from Africa right up there, and then downloaded sequences of subverity uh, from Costa Rica and Belize and, and the areas around the Caribbean. It pops out down here. Not the same taxon. So we're not sure what this is, but interestingly, one sister to it is from Puerto Rico. Hmm. So this is a, this is weird. So to just try and put a name on this one fungus that we found all the time over there requires you to borrow material from all kinds of herbaria, sequence all kinds of other stuff, run phylogenetic trees, and then hope that you get some answer to this. And that's, so that's one of the, the challenges as well. And we, we published this, this paper back in 2016. 18 species, four new ones, 11 new distribution records, 22% uh, in depth. So you're getting the, getting the feel for this. Lepiotas, you've all seen some Lepiotas. Uh, uh, eight species in the genus Lepiota. I have yet to work these up. Uh, two, for good reasons, <laughs> uh, so you know. Uh, there are two species of Leucoprinus. There's this beautiful one right here, Leucoprinus phytolysimus. And then there's this beautiful one here, which is close to Leucoprinus lidocinogranulosus. And it may actually be, but as I said, we haven't worked it up yet. One Amanita, and I'll tell you why this is weird in a moment. Uh, this species was described from the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's where it was originally known from. One Bolete. I have no idea what this one is, Philopolis species. Uh, I, since I don't know what it is, you might be getting it. But that's a good question. Don't eat anything if you don't know what it is. <laughs> that's the simplest rule right there. Uh, we did not look at polypores. The polypores have actually been collected there. Back in the 1890s, when these people went there and first collected them, polypores is what you find. You know, they're there, they last a couple of years, uh, even the annual ones that last a long time. So people collect them. They don't have to dry very you know, quickly, they don't rot on you, you just bring them back. So the polypores are pretty well known, and I hate polypores. Everybody knows that. <laughs> so, uh, but when you see a beautiful one like this, you're going to take a picture of it, right? So this is a polypores tenuiculus. 
uh, which is pretty common throughout Africa. We found some coral fungi. Now this one really blew me away. Because you look at this, and those of you who know coral fungi, you're going, okay, that's a ramaria. You find it, you think it's a ramaria. Also, you know that ramaria is ectomycorrhizal. So you're looking around for, well, where is the ectomycorrhizal host? Well, as you will hear soon, there are no ectomycorrhizal trees in Sao Tome or Principe. As far as we know, no. Which is why you don't find a lot of lactarius or rushulas or amateurs or any of those things, because they require the right trees as the host. So I'm looking at this going, okay, that's a ramaria. Where the hell's the host? So we spent a lot of time looking around to find what could possibly be the epidemiotropic host for it. We could never find it. Brought it back, and I started working it up. And here's what the spores look like under scanning electron microscopy. Right down here, really weird. Those are not ramaria spores. So as it turns out, it belongs to the genus Cytinopogon, which is a saprotroph. Made perfect sense, and it ended up being a new species of uh, Cytinopoga. So, for various reasons, we, at the general Covenja, we named it uh, Cytinopoga uh, Havencampia. And a few others. It's a weird little Clavulina. This one was also described from, from Congo and, uh, and Zambia as well. And a weird genus, Athelaria. Uh, this is an African species as well. A uh, very tough tissue here. I thought when we collected it, it was going to be a tremelodendrosis or something like that, but it's not. This is what it turned out to be. And then there are puffballs as well. Now, the interesting thing about puffballs is that puffballs are designed for long-term survival and long-distance dispersal. Their spores are very tiny, they're globose, they're thick-walled, they're darkly pigmented, and they're typically spiny. And they can travel all the way up into the jet stream, and they can travel all the way around the world. So often, this is not true for most fungi, but often with a lot of the puffball groups, you can find the same species in many places around the world in similar habitats. So they're pretty cosmopolitan, habitat specific, but pretty cosmopolitan around the world. So as it turns out, we have a number of species in, in, the, in Africa here that you can find in temperate areas, like Giastrum timbriatum and like a paradigm moly. They were there, hard to believe. But then you get some weird little uh, earth stars like this guy here. Look at the size of the scale bar down here. These are earth stars with the whole thing when it's open and expanded is the size of a dime. And they grow on a sheet of mycelium, it's called a subiculum. So a little white sheet, remember the sheet. And they grow right on top of that. You can pick up the sheet, lift it up, and pull them all off and hold them up. They're all stuck to this little sheet of mycelium. And then that mycelium just grows all over the sticks and holds all the sticks together. So this is a few species do that. This one is Giasum schwanitia. And then beautiful bird's nest fungi. The cool thing about bird's nest fungi, besides the fact that they form the nest, those little things right there, those are the actual puffballs. That's the bird that you ate in the bird's nest. So the spores are inside those. The drop of rain splashes in there and then splashes them out. So they're basically rain dispersed. But often, when, they're, when those are splashed out, that old cup can serve as a receptacle for a whole new cup to form inside of it. So what you see here is an old uh, nest, bird's nest there with the perennials gone, and a new one, uh, the bird's nest is growing right inside of the old one. That's pretty cool. And when you look down on them, they're really neat as well. So you got to take some fascinating photographs like this as well. Right? And then there are stinkhorns. Now, the sneak horn is, is, a, is a group of, of puffballs that they all start out with a little egg like this. And here's one of the eggs cut in half. They're all gelatinous, rubbery gelatinous on the <coughs> outside. Okay? And then the egg form, they're pretty much inodorous. But as they mature, the outer part of it ruptures. So that's the vulva now. Okay? And out of it grows the sneak horn. And up here at the top is where the spore mass is. It's a gelatinous spore mass. And when they're mature like this, they emit a very strong odor. It's a, an odor typically of dead meat or some rancid, rank odor that attracts insects, mainly flies, to it. So flies are coming to it like they come to dead carrion, basically dead meat. The flies come to it, they feed on the spore mass up here, they lay their eggs in the, in the rest of the stinkhorn, and then the larvae, when they grow up, they have something to feed on as well. And as they do it, and as they eat the, uh, the spore mass here, the fly then flies away somewhere. So the fly is the dispersal agent, the dispersal vector. The fly then poops somewhere. And what a better nitrogen-rich source than, you know, fly poop. 
and the spores germinate there. And the spores are capable of being passed through the digestive system of the dispersal insect, which is pretty cool. And they're often oddball looking at like this. So this is the genus Mutinus, Mutinus bambusinus. Now, uh, I have to have a disclaimer here. Uh, the next slide is going to be a little disturbing. So uh, I, I don't if you, if you get feel bad about it, just turn turn your turn your eyes away. <laughs> we did not plan this this way. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is exactly what we found. Uh, these are these are two un, unopened uh, phallus at, uh, after the vulvatus there, and there's the mature one. Uh, in this genus of, uh, or this group of phallus, they form this little veil that is tucked up underneath the head here, and at maturity, it just cascades down like a little net, like a a, 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 a matrix that are kind of kind of hanging out. You want to show this one? They actually published this picture. The editor didn't want to didn't want to do it. No. <laughs> And this one, this one was even more fun. Uh, if you notice, uh, Bob Drews uh, has been, I've been working with Bob, who led this expedition, as I told you, for, for years, and he's been trying to get me to name a mushroom after him. For, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get me to name a mushroom after him. So when we were there in 2006, we were way up at the top of, of the mountain there on uh, Pico Salto Maine. We're up there at the, one of the highest elevations you can get to. We were walking through, and, and we found this little guy. It's growing, that's just the way it grows, on the side of, of logs like that. And I'm looking at it, and I knew the genus Phallus. There's about 30 species in the world, so it's a relatively small group. And uh, they're, they're pretty well known. When we looked at this, I said, oh, damn, that's, that's a new species. I can, I can feel it. And so I kidded Bob. I said, I'm going to name that after you if it's a new species. And then, of course, all the material was destroyed and lost. So when we went back in 2008, we went back up there to the same area. We didn't find it right at that spot, but we did find it somewhere else on South of May twice. We got two good collections of it, and Brian got these, these nice photographs we brought back in. So I decided, okay, I'm going to name it after you. Now what you need to see is the scale bar. <laughs> it's the, almost the smallest one known. There's a smaller one known called Phallus Pygmy. Uh, but this one is almost the smallest one known. It's the only one that's flaccid. <laughs> so I named it after Bob Drews. It's now called Phallus Drusii. And as soon as, as soon as we published this online, it hit 800,000 hits. I think 600,000 were porn sites. <laughs> but NP, BBC picked it up, NPR picked it up, and Peter Sagal picked it up and put it on as part of his Bluff the Listener show on, on the Saturday, right? So they, they called it, and there it is. So it's now infamous. <laughs> and Bob is proud of it, having the smallest mushroom. <laughs> Gotta have fun with these, right? Uh, a few ascomyces. We did find a lot of ascomyces. But this is the this is the one that holds a little bit less than a quarter of an ounce of scotch. <laughs> and then uh, uh, one last one here, a really bizarre, bizarre fun day. Uh, most of you know the genus Aspergillus is a mold. It's one of these little molds that gets all over you know, you know, the food in your refrigerator if you leave it too long. Sometimes on the walls of your house, it can be a respiratory problem and everything. However, on rare occasion, uh, they can form weird fruiting bodies like this. Now, what they're growing out of this thing right here is a, a fruit pod. Uh, the seeds down inside, they're attached to the seeds. There's a seed right there. So the mycelium is feeding on the seeds, and then the fruiting bodies here of Aspergillus debusciae grow out of those little seeds inside the pod. And then this pod is called monkey pod because the monkeys like to, to feed on these seeds. Uh, when fresh, uh, the, each of these seeds has this nice fruity uh, pulp around it as well, and it smells like fruit. At this stage, when they're really old and rotting, the seeds don't smell like anything. But you know what? These fruiting bodies smell like fruit. Cool. They smell exactly like fruit, and it's awful. It's, it's an obnoxious smell. I brought these into the bathroom of our laboratory and dried them there, and it was driving us out. And it's getting respiratory problems from them as well. Because if you look at a close-up of it, there's a little stem in the middle, and then little tiny stems down the side, and those little round balls are just packets of aspergillus spores, which if you look at a normal aspergillus in a mold, it forms just these little little stems with the packets of spores on top of them, you know, all over a, a mold. But this thing elevates them, 
and then in the wind it shakes, and when a fly comes to it and lands on it, because they're attracted in other insects by this fruity smell, they're coming to lay their eggs and feed on these fruits as well, they land on it, powder just blows everywhere, and there's also a mechanism for attracting flies to it and other insects to it to help disperse its spores. Really interesting. And then there's another uh, species of anascomycete mold as well, genus Seroforum, that grows on the same seeds. They grow right together in the same hunting molds. So really bizarre. Okay. The 2008 expedition. Uh, this year we discovered, that year we discovered 188 species and, and 80 genera. Uh, we were able to recollect 41 of the 52 genera from the, from the first 2006, uh, but we added another 39 genera to that. We were able to collect 51 of the 88 species. So see, you go for a month and collect, you come back two years later, go for a month and collect, and you don't collect everything you did the first time, and you collect a lot of other stuff. So these are just snapshots of the diversity that you can find in these areas. Uh, total diversity in, in the two from four known species we now have at least 125 species in 91 genera, just from two expeditions. <coughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, of the taxonomy groups that we've studied intensively now, and it's about uh, five, six different taxonomic groups now, we're getting anywhere between 22 and 33 percent of them are new species. So that's really giving us kind of a feel for, for how uh, unique uh, this mycota is. Uh, the biggest surprise, we did find four different species in genera that are known to be ectotrophic, although there are no obvious ectotrophic host trees on the islands. So whether we know there are some ectotrophic host trees hiding that we don't know, you look at the lists of all the known flora, and nothing that's ever been re reported there has been known to be ectotrophic. So that's a problem. Or these are saprotrophic species hiding in otherwise ectotrophic genera. We know that happens in Amanita. I don't know of any Rushulas or Sclerodermis or Telopolis that are that way. So we're not, they're not sure what's going on with those four species yet. So that was, that was kind of cool. And lastly, I'll just leave you with, it, with this uh, verbose slide here uh, to talk to you about some of the challenges of doing this kind of stuff. So uh, for years, we've been lucky enough, my lab, to get a National Science Foundation funding uh, to do biotic surveys. The, our government is finally realizing that it's important for us to understand the organisms that occur on the planet before we lose the habitats in which they live. That's good. So there is some funding available for scientists across different organisms to go out and actually document the diversity that's there. Uh, for us, with the fungi, since the fungi are so poorly known, this is not an easy task. And there's a lot of challenges that are involved in, in being able to do this. And certainly, you can't do it in a timely fashion, unfortunately. Uh, we know that climate influences the habitats that support mushrooms. So it certainly as the climate is changing, our habitats are changing, and the diversity and abundance of species occurring in those habitats is changing as well. And we're losing them. They're disappearing. The habitats, as they're disappearing, is basically from deforestation and certainly from human development whether that's agriculture or habitations or, or whatever. So we're the ones that are screwing it up. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we run into all kinds of problems with government restrictions. Most governments don't allow you to remove biodiversity. Uh, now, we've been able to do it and get permits for removing dead organisms, but we can't remove live organisms. So in a, in a, a big project that Brian and I are working on now down in Brazil, where we're working on bioluminescent fungi, we want to grow them, we want to be able to fruit them, we want to be able to do all kinds of experiments with living fungi. We can't remove any of that from Brazil. So we have to do all of that work with living stuff down in the country, down in Brazil. So we collaborate with Brazilians and we're going down in a couple, next month, to spend a couple weeks down there to, to work with them there on the material that's alive. So there's a lot of problems just getting this stuff out to study it. Uh, species are defined by the features of those mushrooms that we're showing. And you all know that those mushrooms are just the sexual reproductive structure of the fungus. So all the mycelium that's out there, that's living there all the time. And when the fungus feels like it, it'll have sex and then produce those little mushrooms. And our taxonomy and our naming and our understanding of all of these species is based on the features of that mushroom. Right? So the environment influences what that mushroom morphology is. As I always say to students, you have to be comfortable with the fact that you may have a mushroom in your hand that is unidentifiable. It may be too young, it may be too old, the environment may have influenced it adversely, so you don't have all the real characters there. You have to be comfortable with that. 
It's not like birders, where you hear another little tweet and it's a new species. Ah, oh, yeah, that's my list. <laughs> we have fun. <laughs> we make fun of each other. So we keep running into each other in the field. Mushrooms are short-lived, exactly. Mushrooms are short-lived, and uh, they, as I said, they only form periodically. So you have to be in the right spot at the right time. And that, you can just witness that by the numbers that we found in 2006 and 2008. In order to put a name on any mushroom in your hand, as I said, you have to know the taxonomy of every genus of mushroom. You really have to know the mushroom very well so you can try and put a name on what you have. And that often requires access to obscure literature. It requires access to historical specimens stored in a herbaria that you can borrow and study and then compare with what you have in hand. Uh, and the species names, as I said, are based on type specimens. And unfortunately, a lot of the species names that are out there, there is no type specimen to study. There isn't the original specimen that was studied by the person who named it, so you can compare it and get a feel for how you can circumscribe that species. That is a big, big problem. So often you have to go back to the actual site or the region where that species was described from, collect something that matches it, and then designate that as what we call a neotype or an epitype or whatever various uh, mechanism you want to name it. Anyway, I won't get into that. Uh, okay. Uh, and then, of course, you get them all back to the lab and you work on them. Some of them just don't cooperate with you in the lab. And, and this is particularly to with the molecules. And so the way we do it now, every, every species that, that we collect, we sequence a particular gene region, which is called the internal transcribed spacer region, the ITS gene, which is a, a region of the genome that is considered the barcode gene region for fungi. So before you can publish everything now, you need to sequence that, and you need to uh, take that sequence and deposit it in a repository, a database called GenBank where then everybody has access to that sequence, and then you have your specimen that you have to cite. So if somebody wants to sequence another gene, they can borrow that specimen, and on and on and on. Uh, so what we do when we, we do these phylogenetic trees is we have the sequences of what we have. We sequence other genes that we think are closely related to it. We have those sequences. And then you download a bunch of stuff from GenBank that belongs to the same genus, and then you align them all, and you run a phylogenetic tree. Problem is that the GenBank is incomplete. A lot of the sequences in GenBank are wrong. They don't actually represent the taxon that they are. So you have those problems as well. And just because you have an ITS sequence that doesn't match anything in GenBank doesn't mean you have a new species. What you have is a sequence that doesn't match anything in GenBank. And that's about as far as you can go. Okay? So there's just a lot of stuff. So it just makes it really, really tough. and makes this whole work long. So as I said, to just get this stuff we collected in 2008, we're about two thirds of the way through with those, with all of that material now. I've got about, I think, six papers, and we've got a couple more on our desk now, and we're getting close to, to, to finishing it. And then we move on to the project that we did in 2010, and maybe <laughs> we'll look at that next. So a decade later, we will we'll get that stuff in. All right, uh, just a few photo credits. Uh, there's Brian Tomo, who's in the field. Uh, Brian and I, most of the soldiers are from us. Uh, Wes Ackerman was the photographer in the 2008 expedition, and Dong Lin was the photographer in the 2006 expedition. They took a, a few photos. They were mainly photographing plants and herbs and stuff like that. But when they found a cool mushroom, they take a few photos for us, so we were able to, to use those. And thank you. If you have questions, I'll certainly address them. Yeah. Okay, so I want to go quick one and then Matt will get that question. But uh, yeah, I asked you to go with the slides. Was that John Harris? It's probably the mushroom. There's there's so many points. That was me. So that was you. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was me back in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> I got grayer. <laughs> that was the next question. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you touched on how the mushroom is biased. Yeah, well, most of these mushrooms are wind dispersed. So, so our guess is, is certainly most of the mushrooms, the ancestors of these, of these species, got to these islands as they were slowly being in, inhabited by other sorts of organisms. And there was something for them to eat there, basically, the plants. Uh, they got there probably as wind dispersed. 
Uh, what we're seeing when we're looking at these, and certainly with the molecules and, and sequencing a lot of stuff and getting a, a real good genetic feel for, for what's there, we're actually finding a lot of the mushrooms there are also occur, or they're closely, the closest related species occurs in the Caribbean region. Now, that could be because, you know, the continents were kind of together, South America and, and, uh, and Africa were there. They split 85 million years ago. Now. So you're talking about really long, old lineages. The same taxon would not have lasted 85 million years without changing and having identical systems from the two. That just wouldn't happen. Uh, but you can certainly explain closely related taxa having shared a common ancestor when the two continents were together. I think mainly what we have is, is a lot of human transference. Uh, the, the chocolate that they grow there, the coffee that they grow there, the bananas that they grow there, all came from either South America or the Caribbean region. And certainly when they brought them over to plant them there, they could have brought soil with them or spores on the surface of them from those areas. They could have easily transplanted uh, the species there that way. The slave trade, again, back and forth from there to the, to the Caribbean area and all the commodities that they brought back and forth. So I think a number of these are relatively recent introductions. And it could have gone both ways. You know, they could have been in the, maybe described originally in the Caribbean, but they could be African species that were brought that direction. So yeah, that, you know. Was both in, 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 uh, in, you know, we're, we're from Africa. Yeah, so the, the transplants that were there all were brought from from the new world to the old world. Believe it or not. Yeah. When you're out, oh, sorry. Go ahead. When you're out in the field, um, how how are you collecting the specimen, and then like when you had to do the whole transportation, how did you transport the specimen? Yeah, when we're in the field, we're, we're basically these are all pretty tiny, so there's not a lot of big mushrooms. Uh, for the big mushrooms, we carry uh, aluminum foil with us, basically, and then just rip off a piece and roll it up like a little tootsie roll and then throw it in a, in a shoulder bag when we're carrying it. Almost all of them fit in these beautiful little uh, fish tackle boxes. And then I also have little tiny plastic boxes that fit inside the fish tackle boxes. So in each little hole of the fish tackle box, I can put two, two collections in little plastic boxes. In those plastic boxes, we'll pick a little bit of moss with some wet leaves and put in and put the mushroom inside so it keeps them fresh. So they'll stay just fresh in those boxes for, for many hours, even though it's 90 degrees and 90% humidity in these areas where we're collecting. It's really hot and humid. Okay? So we get them back to, the, to, the, to the, our laboratory, right, where our scotch is, and we spend all that time taking notes on them. We have dryers. We use vegetable dryers. So the kind of dryer that you can buy to, to do fruit roll-ups and make jerky on and those little things, Nesco Garden Master, Garden Master is the one that we use. I highly, I'm a new spokesperson. <laughs> highly recommend it. In Africa, they're supposed to, the electricity is supposed to be 220. It ranges from about 108 to about 240 at any time during the day, and it goes back and forth, right? And it goes on, it goes off, it goes on, it goes off. So at times, our dryer sounded like a popcorn maker, turning on and off. Pop, 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 pop. These Nesco dryers made it through all of that. No matter what bad electricity we gave to them, they made, they're fantastic, right? And we use about 105 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And it just basically dries the mushrooms in, in these little guys in a matter of hours. And then while they're still in the dryer, we have a Ziploc bags. You put a, you put a field label with them so you know your, your number. So if you saw that, we have an accession book. Every specimen gets a number. We take our notes. Our notes have the number of the specimen. We have a field label. We put the name on it, or a field name, whatever we can do, genus anyway, and our collection number on it. And then that goes in a Ziploc bag. You take them off the dryer while they're still warm. You shove them in the Ziploc bag, and you seal it up. If you leave them on the dryer, and you turn off the dryer, and you come back an hour later, because of the humidity in the atmosphere, they've <laughs> soaked up that water again. You put them in a bag at that point. We've done this. This is how we learn. And, and you, you get back, they're all moldy. And you've lost all the specimens. So you, have, you learn these through you know, trial and error. You put them in these little bags, and keep them dry. And then all the Ziploc bags go into another big Ziploc bag. So you throw some desiccant, some silica gel in there to take any humidity out of that. And then you pack them tightly in a cardboard box. And then what we did this time, since we lost them all in our the only mail service goes to Lagos, Nigeria. 
we didn't want to trust that. <laughs> and there was no DHL, no FedEx, no nothing like that, it was just mail. And I didn't want anyone to log us, because they would, they would have destroyed it. So instead, we put our trust in the airlines, and they destroyed it. Uh, so what I did was, I had permits to get them into the U.S. I did, have, did not have permits to carry them into any European country. And you fly through Portugal, and then the last time we flew out, our plane was canceled. We had to wait some days. Uh, and then we had to fly through Frankfurt. Lisbon to Frankfurt and back. I actually hand carried them in a bag with me through security, through the little things and everything else. They opened it up and said nothing about it. So I was very, very lucky. We wanted to make sure I got it back. And those permits, I mean, how difficult are they to get? Let's say if I was to go travel and I wanted to do some collection of my own. How you hard? have, they're not easy to get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> particularly getting them back into our country. You have to have a reason for why you're bringing dirt. And what dead kind of sticks. Do you need to get that? <laughs> what kind of clouds do you need to get that to be successful? Uh, you, you, yeah, you work with you work with somebody, a professor somewhere at the institute, uh, something like that. Then then we have you know the cachet and the credentials to ask for those permits from the government, tell them what we're doing, what we're doing. And we're also, most of our, our research has been funded by uh, federal grants anyway, so that's pretty easy. Getting them out of the other country now, when you're there, you've got to go to their their people. And most of that is. <laughs> so on the last NSF grant I had, I had a budget line that was called Permit Acquisition Fees. <laughs> I am not kidding you. Five thousand dollars into a line, Permit Acquisition Fees. That was just bribes and graft. And then you just when you come in, because you'll get it done, but do you want it done now, or do you want it done a month from now, the paperwork? And if you just slip a few dollars, uh, and they expect it. I know they're, they're basically government employees. They're told if you want to make money, this is the way you get money in all of these countries. It doesn't matter, throughout Southeast Asia, throughout Brazil, throughout Africa, this, throughout Indonesia where I did a lot of work, that's what you do. So you just stuff, and that's not a lot, 20 bucks. You know, you get them done, sign, stamp, that, you're out the door. Yeah. Dennis, just yeah. let me make a quick comment, I mean, not comment, but um, request. Before yeah. everybody goes out and leave, we'd like for you to help us put your seats back. We need to put the room back in order. So when Dennis finishes, Tyler will tell us where we need to do with what we need to do with the seats. Thanks. Yes. Could you tell us what uh, what kind of microscope you travel with? We don't take a uh, microscope with us. No microscopy is done in the field. There's no time. So you do the it field all is all dedicated to the, 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 the field is dedicated to nothing but collecting, taking notes. And like I said, we get up early in the morning. We go in the field, collect notes from half to two thirds of the day. And then we're working until midnight. And then we're photographing, and then the next day we do the same thing. We do that for a month straight. It kicks your butt, I'm telling you. And then all the microscopy is done on dried specimens. We, we okay. you can slice them up, section them better, revive them, we yeah. do that. And we make sure that with good fresh material, you can get DNA out of it, extract it pretty easily. So we do that all from the either dried material or material that we can fresh and never Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, one more question, then you guys can go. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that so many other species are small, like the hypoloma. Um, <coughs> can you rationalize that that would be a function of uh, island dwarfism? Is that a good test? Are there other examples of that working on fungi, or is it more a function of a tropical environment? No, no echo. Well, what, what they're doing is they're, they're often forming small fungi, but they're forming a lot of them. Okay, so whether, and there's, there is so much competition in tropical forests for the resources, the turnover is amazing. So what you have is a tremendous diversity of species out there. And the mycelium, let's just talk about fungi for now. The mycelium there is all fighting against any other individuals of their own species and certainly other species for access to those resources. So they're all pretty well evolved and adapted for the feeding and those resources go pretty quick. So in order to go a big fungus, you need access to a lot of resources and pretty continuous. So with an ectotrophic tree, uh, fungus, you're actually getting a lot of those resources and sugars from the mycelium that's connected to the tree that's, that's you know, transporting it to them. So they actually have more resources to both water and to, and to the sugars that they need to grow. So, and they can grow larger fruiting bodies because of that. Fewer of them, but each one larger. At the end, probably the number of spores they do is the same. In the tropics with the little guys, there's so many resources there that are turned over so quickly, access to those resources is kind of hard to get for the fungi. So they can produce little fruiting bodies pretty quickly and with not a lot of metabolism and you know, costs to do that. 
And but then with you know in the population, they're just getting all the little resources around, they form lots of little pretty bodies, and they can really quickly get their spores out. So you need to you need to produce quick, get your spores out, get them germinated, and get to the resources if you want to survive in these sorts of habitats. And it's easier to do that with little fungi that form really quickly. That's my take on it. How much seasonality is there in that topic? There is still seasonality. And that's the thing that we found in Hawaii. We did the, you know, the mushrooms in Hawaii as well. We thought, okay, you know, some of these areas, it's wet most of the time. Uh, it's warm most of the time. I mean, the conditions are perfect to grow mushrooms all the time. We would go over there. You'd have a season in January. It was pretty good. And there would be a season in, in June and July. that was pretty good. And those areas didn't produce anything the rest of the year. <coughs> So it, it, there's some rhythm as well. Uh, even though they're saprotrophs, you know, the leaves fall at a certain time for deciduous trees, and so your resources are there at a certain time that you can, you know. Other times, it, you know, you go dormant, you don't, hurt, you don't have sex. You know, <coughs> movies aren't good that weekend, so, you know. So it's just... <laughs> All right, thanks for coming.